Okay, uh, so, so welcome to the third part of these lectures. And before we were discussing um, the Poincaré and log sobolev inequalities on Rn. Uh, and uh, now I would like to uh, say a few words on how you can generalize all of this to other settings. And this can be done in several directions, but uh, well, I will, I will list uh, a few of them and then I will focus on, on a single one. So first, let, let's speak about Riemannian manifold. So of course, it, it gets uh, more involved because, well, you need to master this differential geometry language first. But well, I, I'm definitely not the person to discuss this in detail. I, I have never mastered it well enough. But in general, once you, once you have uh, all the setting prepared, then it works in a similar way. So, so instead of the Lebesgue measure, you need the Riemannian volume. Instead of the Euclidean norm of the gradient, you, you use uh, the, 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 the scalar product, uh, which you have from the Riemannian structure. right? And of course, it's the geometry that comes into the picture now, especially the Ricci curvature. But I'm not going to speak about it. You can find it in the book by Bakri Gentil and, and Ledoux. It's, uh, everything there is written in, in, in this generality. Okay, then something which is uh, closer to my heart, let's say it's the case of, so to speak, continuous metric spaces. So what do I mean by continuous? Well, these are met metric measure spaces, perhaps I should say we have a measure, and but we don't have the differential structure. Still, in many situations, we can overcome it because instead of speaking of the gradient, we can uh, directly speak about the length of the gradient without defining the gradient itself. And one, one of the ways to, to do it is um, via this formula. So you can think of it, D is the metric, right? Like the local Lipschitz, local Lipschitz uh, form at, uh, Mm, at x, uh, local Lipschitz norm. And then the, the good thing about this expression is that you can, um, um, you can work with it um, quite conveniently because it, it is well adapted, it behaves well under compositions uh, of our function with uh, uh, local Lipschitz functions. So, so that's why you, you can, it enters uh, instead of, of the chain rule for, for the gradient and it works pretty well. Then for discrete situations, uh, you, you cannot uh, use this formula. And there are various types of uh, estimates. Sometimes one, one defines the notion of the discrete gradient on some length of the gradient, which is suitable in a given situation. And the thing I would like to discuss and the, the, the idea which we saw in, in the other lectures um, by, by Joe or by Giovanni is to use the language of Markov processes and Dirichlet forms. It, it, it's a quite general language. Uh, it allows to recover both many of those discrete situations and this Riemannian setting or, or RN. And so now, and now I will very briefly introduce this language and. I apologize, it will be very brief. And for those of you who haven't seen much of it before, uh, even if you saw a glimpse of it in, in the other lectures, uh, it, it may be like the, the slide may be um, uh, filled with the formulas. Uh, it may not be very pleasant, but and the formulas, some of them may not be very um, intuitive at first, but then I will try to go over several examples to somehow show how it works. Okay, let me just move. This menu is covering my screen. Okay. So so it will be rather informal. I will not care about all those analytic issues that, that one um, has to take care of in practice. I believe that uh, thinking of it in terms of Markov processes on finite state spaces is, is enough. Um, the rest is technicalities but we will see also continuous examples. So let's assume that we have a probability space and we have um, 
uh, reversible with respect to mu stationary, like mu stationary Markov process. So mu is the invariant measure. Uh, by reversibility here, I mean that, well, first of all, it is uh, uh, stationary, xt is distributed according to mu, and then um, whether you run it forward in time or backwards in time, it has the same, the same distribution. And we have a transition function um, related to this, to this process. So we also have the corresponding semi-group of operators, which thanks to this reversibility, um, well, um, they, they will be symmetric on L2. But first you, you define it usually on bounded functions. And so here I wrote several formulas um, uh, because I, I, I will be using uh, a few of them uh, at, at some point. But this is, of course, the usual Markov, Markov semigroup here. And uh, we will think of it as, as a semigroup on L2 of mu. So we want it to be strongly continuous. And, and well, I, I'm not going to discuss some um, assumptions. Everything I'm going to speak about will be at, let's say, a formal level and the details. Um, will be skipped. So, so this is the generator, right? So, so we differentiate PTF at uh, zero and uh, it is with, um, with uh, the limit is in L2, right? With respect to the L2 norm. And then we have the crucial object, which we saw in, in the other lectures, the Dirichlet form, which is defined like this. And from this definition, we do not see too many properties of this form. Uh, but we can see that it is a bilinear form, right, which is um, uh, symmetric, right? We can interchange G and F thanks to, well, alpha, L is um, set at jump. Right? And perhaps the most mysterious object here, the carré Dichon operator, the square of the field, which is given just by this formula. And again, you see here that you need some assumptions for this to work, but, but let's assume that everything is well defined. So the relation between the two, well, gamma is also a bilinear form, but um, it's not a real valued form, right? It, it produces a function. So when you differentiate, uh, when you integrate gamma with respect to mu, you will recover the Dirichlet form. Okay, so, so not much can be seen from these formulas from the point of view, at least of our applications. Let's, let's look at examples. Let me start with Rn so that we can see that uh, it recovers the framework we worked with uh, in the two previous um, lectures. Okay, so, so let's assume it's not the more general, most general example, but it's the one that is usually introduced here. Let's assume that we have a measure of this form. Uh, that density of the, is of the form e to minus v. And then let's look at such a generator, such an operator, right, which is Laplacian. And here we have something which you may think of it as the drift. So this is the diffusion part. This is like, like a drift. And this is, this turns out to be a generator of a diffusion with invariant measure mu. And in this case, when you plug in this definition into the, the formulas from the previous slide. Then using integration by parts, I will not do it, but using integration by parts, we will see that gamma of f and g, well, at a point x, um, the, it, it will be um, just the inner product of the gradients of f and g. And well, after you integrate it, you will get the Dirichlet form, which is Mm, this this integral of the inner product. So in particular on the diagonal, which will be of interest to us, gamma of f, f is just the um, squared Euclidean length of the gradient. And uh, the Dirichlet form of f, f is uh, just the second moment of this Euclidean length, which is the right-hand side that appeared in our inequalities, right? Both in Poincaré and log sobolev inequalities. So we can see here the, the link. And let me just mention that for, for this Gaussian potential, you, we get this einstein um, semi-group with, with this generator, which was used by Joe, for example, in his proofs for the um, Gaussian isoperimetric inequality. Okay, so, so this is just to see that it covers the, our previous setting. Let me go to examples which will be 
uh, more interesting to us uh, today. So, so let's assume that we have a kernel. By a kernel, I mean a function of two variables. Here in the subscript, I will write a variable from x. We call that x is our probability space. And f is the sigma field of reference for us. So the other argument will be a set. And we require from it, uh, apart from some measurability, we, we require from it that for fixed, let's say spatial argument as a function of the set, this is, this is a positive measure. And since we want to deal with um, symmetric objects, we will require such a symmetry condition. And, uh, in physics, it is often called uh, the detailed balance condition. So may think of it in the following way that if you first choose a point according to mu, and then you move this point, it's of course informal here, especially that it doesn't have to be the, the probability measure, but if you move this point according to this kernel, then uh, th this measure will be symmetric, uh, like uh, the measure of A times B and, and B times A might be the, the same. And then one can define the uh, linear operator L in this form. And you can, of course, wonder wh where it will be, when it will be well defined. In the applications I will have in mind later, or at least in examples, for each x, q will be a finite measure. So this will be well defined at least for bounded functions. But you can also think of examples, for example, related to the Poisson space where, where q is not necessarily finite. Anyway, if you define the operator like this, and then you use the same formulas again, we, which we used uh, on, on the well, two slides before, then you will get such um, bilinear form. And it will be an integral with respect to mu of this expression. So when you think of f equal to g, here will be, it will be f of y minus f of x squared integrated with respect to this qx of dy. So it will be a function of x. And you can see that it looks in some sense as the, uh, average square of uh, increment in the direction of this kernel, right? It's, it's very informal, but it is like some sort of um, length of, of a gradient. One, one can think of it in this way. And one remark which will be useful for us later, thanks to this reversibility condition, one can in fact, uh, well, we have some symmetry here and one can, for example, when f equals to g, one can uh, restrict the integration to the set when uh, f of x is greater than f of y. And it will give the same contribution as the complement. So when, when one removes this one half, it turns out that uh, um, this, this Dirichlet form will be also an integral of, of such a uh, expression gamma plus, which is more or less the same as we had before, but we take just the positive part here. And it turns out that in many situations, it, it is important to have this positive part. So I will come back to this. Okay, so this slide was again, rather abstract and overcrowded with formulas. Let, let me show a concrete example on, on a countable state space. So we want an operator acting on functions of X. So in this case, it will be given by an infinite potentially infinite, well, X can be finite, but uh, potentially infinite matrix indexed by the elements of X. And now the condition we have here is that all the of diagonal elements are um, non-zero, uh, are non-negative, and the uh, sum in each row is zero. So it means that the um, diagonal elements are uh, minus the uh, sum of the remaining elements in the row. And we interpret this, so, so I'm repeating it quickly, but most of you must have heard it um, before. So, so we think of lambda xy here as the intensity of jumps from x to y. So our process is a process with three leaves on this space x, and it stays at x for an exponential time with parameter lambda xx, so with mean one over lambda xx. 
So this is the um, escape rate, let's say, and then jumps to y with probability given by, by this expression. Like thanks to this assumption, this gives, uh, um, this is uh, a probability measure, right? Those weights define a probability measure, telling us how to exit uh, our, our present, present state. And then when it's written like that, you, you will see that uh, this is a special case, uh, like this probability is defined the kernel corresponding to X at the measure. So let me just show you one example here, the birth and death chain. So the state space uh, is the set of natural numbers and we have jumps only, our process can only increase or decrease right, when it changes by one. So, so we interpreted that the, the process describes the, um, number of uh, individuals in a population and bi stands for the birth rate and di for the death rate so it decreases the population uh, and then um, for, for a special case where the birth, birth rate is one and the death rate is uh, in the, uh, is proportional to the size of the population this is well this may look strange from the point of view of the population but this describes it is a well-known model mm infinity q this is a model that describes the number of clients uh, in the system if uh, the income of clients is uh, governed by a poisson process uh, with, with rate one and uh, all the there are infinitely many servers which serve the clients immediately, but the serving times have exponential distributions that are independent. So then it turns out that it's the Poisson measure, which is the stationary measure. And this is what the generator looks like. And this is what, uh, what the Dirichlet um, form looks like. So you can see that this is the average squared length of some sort of discrete gradients here, right? We have those increments here. And I wanted to, to, to state this example because when you look at it, you will see that it's like, like a toy model for what uh, Giovanni was speaking about. So Giovanni had uh, the einstein ullenbeck semigroup on the Poisson space and he cared about the position of points. Here it's like the Poisson process, but the state space for this Poisson process is just one element. So all the points end up in the same place. And then you can see that this part corresponds to this add plus, um, add one um, uh, gradient, uh, and, and this one to this remove one, right? We, we decrease. So, so it, it's like this orstein mullenbeck process on the Poisson space. One can also see the similarities with the usual orstein mullenbeck process. So this is like the Poisson part, which should be compared with the Gaussian part. And this is like a drift. Right? So, so there are some connections here. Let me move forward and let me define one more class of um, processes that we may be interested in. So we have here um, a product space so e is is just some it's a measurable space and i is a finite set you may think of it as one to n i wrote it as a finite set because uh, it may correspond for example to edges of um, of some graph right? we can have dynamics on the edges for example so so it's not necessarily one to n uh, it doesn't matter for us here then we have an x-valued random variable. So it sits in this product space. And here I have a conflict of notation, which I noticed too late and I was afraid of changing it at the last minute, but it's not a big conflict. So before we had a process xt and we just have a random vector x and xi denote the coordinates of, of this random vector. So, when I write i, it's always a random vector. When I write t, it's the time parameter, but I will not use both at the same time. So, so here it's just a random vector with coordinates x1 up to xn. So now we look at the law of this random vector and we ask a question, if we fix all coordinates except for the i one, what is the conditional distribution of the i coordinate? And we denote it by mu i. So it should be, it's a function of x, it's the regular conditional distribution here. 
And the generator of the Glauber dynamics is given by this formula. So we just integrate the increments with respect to this i conditional measure and add it up. So in words, it means that each coordinate has its independent clock, Poisson clock, after an exponential time when, when the clock rings, we keep all the coordinates unchanged and we resample the i coordinate, the coordinate for which it rank, uh, by a new element sampled from this conditional distribution. So when time goes on, on each coordinate, we somehow uh, make it conditionally looking more like, like the measure mu. And in the limit, it turns out that uh, this is an ergodic process. You, you will get mu in the limit. So, so that's why I mentioned Gibbs sampler, because in discrete time, this is a method often used for, for approximate sampling in this Markov chain Monte Carlo community. So, so I hope that, that the definition here is clear, like this description is more important than the formula. Just after an exponential time, resample the i coordinate with respect to this conditional measure mu. Okay, so these are, these are the examples. Now I can finally move to the functional inequalities. So given such a structure, this abstract structure, which we just discussed, so we have a Dirichlet form and um, the invariant measure mu, we will consider three types of inequalities this time. So we will say that the Poincaré inequality holds if for admissible functions f, what does it mean admissible? So, so it simply means that it should be in the domain of the Dirichlet form, which uh, I haven't discussed, right? So, so that's why I'm hiding here in, in all the definitions behind this word admissible, and we will not get into the details. But on finite state spaces, it's just um, arbitrary function. Right? So the variance is bounded by, by this Dirichlet form. And let me recall again that on Rn, by which I mean that in the class of examples we, we had before. This is just the second moment of the gradient. So, so this reduces to the definition. So. And it's the same for the log sobolev inequality. But now we also have another inequality. It's sometimes called the modified log sobolev inequality and sometimes the entropic inequality. I prefer to use here the, this name, entropic inequality, because I use the other name for, for the inequalities uh, of log Sobolev type discussed uh, in the last, last lecture. So please note the difference here. So here we were using evaluating this Dirichlet form on the diagonal. Here we, we are evaluating thinking it on F and log F. So in fact, it's not a priori clear. Well, even here, I, I, I never discussed the question of positive definiteness, why, why the right-hand side should be non-negative, but we will see it shortly also, also in this case. And now let me explain why I'm dealing with three different inequalities. This has to do with the chain rule, which um, was useful to us in, in this smooth case but which is not present in, in this um, general case. So for this Rn setting, this entropic inequality and log Sobolev inequality turn out to be equivalent. And this is just by the chain rule. So without paying attention to, to some fine details, uh, well, if you assume the log Sobolev inequality and want to prove the entropic inequality, well, you have to plug in the square root of F on the to the log Sobolev inequality, please note the difference. There is no square here for the entropic inequality. So you use the log Sobolev inequality for square root of f, and then you you just differentiate. Once you use the chain rule and differentiate, you will get such an expression. But now when you write this uh, square of the length of the gradient as the inner product. 
and combine f with uh, one over f with the gradient of f, you will see that the, it's the same as this right hand side. Right? And this right hand side is just this epsilon of f log f in, in our setting. Right? The, not epsilon, uh, e of f log f, the Dirich level, right? So maybe let me write it that this guy in our setting c f log f. And in the other direction, it's even simpler, so I will not discuss it. So on our end, they are equivalent, but this is not the case uh, in general. So for instance, this MM infinity Q, the, this dynamics introduced there, so corresponding to, to such Dirichlet form where X is the Poisson variable, it does not satisfy the log Sobolev inequality, but it does satisfy the entropic inequality. So, so in, in this setting, the, they are different. And we have the following chain of implications. Log Sobolev implies this entropic inequality and this implies the Poincaré inequality. So I will prove this in a moment, but uh, let, let me first um, um, tell you a little bit more about those Dirichlet forms and let me write them uh, using the uh, transition function. This will be the formulas which will allow us to uh, overcome those difficulties related to lack of the chain rule. So usually it's written in a more analytic notation, but to, to fit it on, on the screen, I use the probabilistic one. Uh, and again, I'm doing it formally without paying much attention to, to, to analytic details here. So, so we have this formula by definition for the Dirichlet the form. Then when we plug in the formula for the um, infinitesimal operator, it, it's something like that. Now playing, moving this limit outside, right? Uh, putting this f of x zero inside the um, conditional expectation, which we can do, and integrating, we will arrive at such a formula. And now, uh, Please remember that our process, so here again, X, X is the process, right? Uh, it is stationary, meaning that instead of X zero, uh, here I could write XT at both places, and it is reversible, which means that I could change, swap X zero and XT here. So using this fact, and somehow splitting these two terms, we can get such an expression, and this can be transformed into a product. Right. So, so then expressing this expectation and uh, the conditional expectation of respect uh, of uh, xt with respect to x0, we can write it as such an integral. So why is it useful? Because now we have the following consequence. If we have four functions which satisfy this pointwise inequality, then it will be preserved under integration and limit. Right. So as a consequence, we have an inequality on the Dirichlet forms. And in particular, of course, this means that this is non negative because here we have a square, but also that f log f is non negative because um, logarithm is uh, increasing, right? So, so here the signs of each factors will be always the same. So the right hand sides in our inequalities are non negative. But I'm deriving this mostly to prove this proposition. Right? So I'm not going to discuss the implication from the entropic inequality to the Poincaré inequality. It's again by, by applying it to one plus F, applying the entropic inequality, uh, one plus epsilon F and using the Tyler's expansion, just uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, on, on our end when we were proving the implication from log Sobolev to Poincaré. But let's look at this implication. So applying log Sobolev again to square root of f, we have this inequality. And now we have a pointwise inequality, which you can verify as an exercise. And if we take a equal to f of y, let's say, and b equal to f of x, this will allow us to, using this inequality, will allow us to compare these Dirichlet forms. And now plugging this at the right-hand side of, of our log Sobolev inequality for 
square root of f will we obtain this entropic inequality. So as you can see, uh, this is this is very simple, and this is how you can bypass this uh, chain rule, which you don't have in general. Okay, so this is what I said before. The second implication is by Taylor's expansion. So now we can move finally to concentration. So um, we have the following theorem. The Poincare inequality implies sub-exponential concentration, the entropic inequality, and so also the Noxobelev inequality implies the sub-Gaussian concentration. So this looks just as in the case of Rn, but in Rn we had Lipschitz functions. Here our assumption is that we have a pointwise bound on the square root of this um, carré dichon operator, because please remember then on Rn, this is just the length of the gradient, so a pointwise bound on the length of the gradient corresponds to the Lipschitz, the Lipschitz condition. And the proofs are very similar to what we saw on Rn. Uh, so this is the Ida struct argument, iteration of the Poincare inequality. This is the Herbst argument. So uh, rewriting the log sub of inequality as a differential inequality for the log Laplace transform of, of the random variable we are interested in, of this one. But uh, let me show you a part of this proof of the second one, just to see how, again, we can overcome these problems with gradient. Because let me remind that we were applying the log sub of inequality to this function and we are differentiating it on our end. So we are using the chain rule. Okay, so let me first do a non rigorous observation, non-rigorous because, well, this was defined in the L2 sense, now I use it in a pointwise sense. You can always choose a subsequence. Let's just, let's just calculate. So for FF, this was the definition of the, this Caradition operator. When you plug in the definition of the generator and move express in terms of the transition function and move this integral outside of everything, we can do it because PT is a probability measure, then you will get some cancellations here. And you will see that uh, such a formula holds for, um, uh, for this car addition. Okay, so now let's move to the proof of the concentration inequality. We apply this entropic inequality to e to lambda f to get the same left hand side. This is the entropy, the same left hand side as in the usual Herbst argument on Rn. Now, this is the right hand side of our entropic inequality. So, this is the Dirichlet form of our function and its logarithm. And when we write the definition of this Dirichlet form in terms of the transition function, which we had. Um, two slides ago, right? Um, we had this calculation. Then, well, I, I skipped one step here. So then we can observe again that, that we have this symmetry, which allows us, right? In, in this formula, we, we didn't have plus here, the positive part, but we had one over two T. So using this symmetry, we can stay on the positive part but get rid of this one half. So we have this inequality. So the plus here matters, why? Because now we can use convexity of the exponential function to bound this one by e to lambda f of x times f of x minus f of y, right? And um, you are positive everywhere, so, so we'll get this this expression here, and um, and now um, we can forget about this plus. So after some manipulations like moving the limit inside, taking this e to lambda f of x outside of the inner integral, right, we recognize here the expression that we had above for gamma. Up to this 
one half, which we have here. So together with this, we have our gamma. And you get such an expression. But gamma was bounded by L squared. This was our assumption. So moving it outside the integral, we have this entropy of e to lambda f on the left-hand side. And we have expectation of e to lambda f on the right-hand side. This is exactly the starting point for the um, Herbst argument. So from now on, it goes exactly in the same way as, uh, as you saw in the, in the first lecture. So this is how you can overcome. And now let me just mention that um, in this kernel case, we could plug in, in this kernel case, this Dirichlet form was given also by expectation of this gamma plus. So then we don't lose this factor two and we get a better constant. So uh, let me just mention this because in our examples, we will be in the kernel case. Okay, so I'm a little bit behind time, so. Mm, let me let me mm, pass to examples, and I will discuss mm, mostly inequalities for product measures. But uh, at the end, I will mention something about more general, maybe not more general, but about results for, for the global dynamics. Let us start with the variance and with a very simple observation. If we have a random variable and its independent copy, then the variance can be written by this formula. This is very, a very easy observation. Just take the square and uh, use independence and equal distribution and it is almost immediate. By symmetry, we can also write it without this one half, but with plus. And now we have a consequence, immediate consequence of the tensorization property for variance which is a famous inequality due to Efron and Stein. It was mentioned um, yesterday by Giovanni. So here again, X is a random vector with components X1 up to Xn. So, uh, th there is no um, stochastic process uh, at the moment. So let's assume that we have such a random vector with independent components. And let's introduce also uh, an independent copy of our random vector and another sequence of independent copies. So here we keep all the coordinates unchanged, but we replace the ith one by its independent copy. And then it turns out that the variance is bounded by, by this expression. And also you can get rid of this one half and add plus here, which matters in applications. So how do we get this? We just know by tensorization that variance is smaller than the um, average sum of conditional variances with respect to um, uh, variances counted to, with respect, calculated with respect to the i coordinates. And for the i sum and for the i variance, you just plug in this inequality, which will result in keeping all the coordinates intact and changing, replacing this one with an independent one. And we also have another inequality, a similar one for entropy. This is the definition for, of entropy. Now using Jensen's inequality to move this expectation outside of the logarithm, we will see a covariance of F and its logarithm. That it can be again written in the language of, of an independent copy. So repeating the previous proof of this Efron Stein inequality and using uh, tensorization of entropy, we get something like that, that the entropy of F on a product space is bounded by such an expression where here we replace the i coordinate but it's independent copy and keep the rest unchanged. So please note that exchanging um, this i coordinate by its independent copy is exactly the operation that we had in this Glauber dynamics, right? There we were resampling the i coordinate uh, according to the conditional distribution of the i coordinate given the remaining coordinates. But here the coordinates are independent. So just replacing by independent copy is the same as, as this resampling with respect to the conditional distribution because it's, it's the same distribution as the unconditional. So the above two inequalities can be rewritten 
in the language of Glauber dynamics, namely the Glauber dynamics for product measures satisfies both the Poincaré and the entropic inequalities. So it may look kind of silly to speak about deep sampler for, for the product measure because it is used uh, uh, for approximate sampling right, in, in applications and, and to apply it, you have to be able, able to sample simple things to be able to sample more general distributions. Uh, but, but from the point of view of this general um, setting uh, and the relation of um, Dirichlet forms and uh, Markov processes to concentration, this may, it makes sense to formulate it in this language. And now we will be able to use uh, the concentration results that we had before. So it satisfies these two inequalities. And what about the, the usual log sobolet inequality? So it turns out that for global dynamics, it can only hold, in a sense, in finitely supported spaces. It, it's easy to see. So it's not precise what I'm saying here, but what do I mean by finitely supported? So the probability space has to consist of some atoms and finitely many of them. Uh, you, you simply get from this inequality a lower bound on the um, measure um, of any set. If a set has non-zero measure, then this measure has to be lower bounded by, by some positive uh, quantity. So, so in the end, you, you can just have um, finitely many atoms. So here, on the other hand, at least in the product case, this holds without any assumptions on on the measure. So from the point of view of concentration, uh, this entropic inequality is more useful, but still for, for other applications, uh, this log of inequality is crucial, for example, for some hypercontractivity, which I'm not going to discuss. Okay, so, so let me show you an application because so far in practically in all three lectures, I was just um, giving you the abstract theory without any um, concrete applications. So, so let's see one. Uh, consider a random vector with independent components, uh, which are bounded. So, so it's a random vector supported in the in the cube, high dimensional cube. And let's consider a function, an L Lipschitz function, and we assume additionally that it is. You may think convex, but it's enough to say separately convex, by which I mean that it's convex in the, uh, along each coordinate. And then let's calculate this gamma plus of f for the global dynamics. So recall that it was f of x minus the resampled vector, the positive part squared. Now using convexity, this is smaller than f prime of Mm, sorry, I should write delta i, the, the partial derivative of x along the i coordinate times, uh, sorry, times mm, x minus x i prime, right? This is the, this is the distance bet between them, mm. right? So now thanks to this positive part, you can square it and obtain such a bound. And now this thing after squaring is bounded by four and the function is Lipschitz. So altogether you get a pointwise bound and you are in the, in the setting of, of our uh, concentration result right? for this gamma plus, this is bounded. So you get a theorem due to Michel Ledoux that all separately convex Lipschitz functions admit a concentration, sub-Gaussian concentration bound, which is independent on the dimension for, for product measures. And the remarkable fact about this result is that if you would like to have it for all Lipschitz functions, then by results due to Goslan I mentioned last time, um, the measure would have to satisfy the Poincaré inequality. So it, it would have to be very regular. For example, the support uh, could not be disconnected, right? And here we can apply it, for example, for random signs for arbitrary product distribution. So Talagrand proved it originally for um, Rademacher variables and later extended it. So, so 
this statement for Rademacher variables immediately gives a strengthening of the kinchin kahan inequality uh, with an improved right-hand side, which turned out to be very useful in probability in Banach spaces, for example. So let me just mention that there are proofs of this um, uh, fact. And I mean, originally, Telegrant proved it also for convex function for the lower bound. And there are proofs uh, for the lower tail, sorry. There are proofs for the lower tail. Uh, which use this entropy methods. The first one was proposed by Samson, but it also used some transportation. Another is proposed by um, Boucheron, Bousquet, um, Lugosi, and Massar, but it's uh, none of them is trivial. You can find it in, in the book by Boucheron, um, Lugosi, and, and Massar. Okay, so if I can have two more minutes, uh, then I will just mention non-product examples and, and I will stop here. So I hope it, it's, it's okay. So let me just mention that you do have non-product examples. Mm. I, I will restrict attention to finite state spaces here. And the parameters of those inequalities are expressed in terms of um, what is known as the Dobrushin matrix. So without going into details because we don't have time here, it roughly tells you, AIJ tells you how much the j coordinate influences the i coordinate if you fix the remaining coordinates. So if you change the j coordinate and look how the conditional probability of the i coordinate changes, the diameter, let's say, of this set in total variation gives you the coefficient of the matrix. If the matrix, if we are in the product case, this is the zero matrix. And then we look at the operator norm of the matrix and we look how far it is from, from one. We also need some assumptions on the smallest atom. And then we get uh, those log sobolev and entropic inequalities with parameters not depending on the dimension, but only on those, those two quantities, alpha and beta. And you can see again that the um, um, parameter for the log sobolev inequality uh, is larger than for the entropic inequality. So, so this can be obtained more easily. Uh, le let me mention that, uh, okay, maybe, maybe let me. Um, let me not mention anything here, but just show you the last slide. So as an example, we can have um, the Ising model, which as you know, is, describes configurations of spins. So here we have a finite set. We have a spin plus or minus one at each element of this set from one to N. And they interact from some matrix and we have an external field. So the Hamiltonian, as you all know, is written like this. And using the previous results, Goetze, Sambal, and Simulis uh, obtained the log Sobolev and modified log Sobolev inequalities in this setting with such parameters. So, so you have to plug them in the previous result. And uh, here, the um, one unfortunate thing, let me make a final remark, is that uh, uh, it depends on the absolute values of, of this uh, interaction elements of the interaction matrix. Whereas in some applications, for example, for, for some spin glass models, we, we would like to have it uh, in terms of uh, some norms of the matrix without these absolute values. And some results towards Poincaré inequality have been recently obtained here by, by Ron and Eldan and offers it to me. Uh, okay. And, but using this result uh, by Marton and uh, this free authors, you can also create examples uh, which are relevant in combinatorics. So maybe let me stop here.